All right, good morning. So it's great to have some rain. I grew up in Oregon, so I miss this kind of weather. But um, I'm going to go over sleep disorders. I mentioned in the introductory paragraph, it is really hard with some of these lectures to whittle down, you know, what to talk about, what to not talk about. Uh, so the official classification lists 85 different sleep disorders. Obviously, we can't go through all of those. So um, I think what I'm giving here in this handout are, are the highlights and most important things uh, for you to know. Let's first start out with a little bit of normal physiology of sleep, normal neurobiology of sleep. Um, more is being understood about sleep and the importance of sleep. We know that uh, sleep is important for being able to maintain normal attention throughout the day. Um, a lot of evidence in just recent years, pretty exciting stuff about the importance of sleep and memory, especially converting short-term into long-term memory, and also just basic executive functioning. So people that are sleep-deprived tend to perform poorly, especially in uh, these areas. And there's also evidence that um, clearance of you know, things that you don't want circulating in the brain, like beta amyloid, uh, other waste products uh, can be helpful uh, during sleep. So uh, there's a lot on this slide, but I just want to highlight what are uh, some of the important things here. So I wouldn't spend much time worrying about which neurotransmitters are involved in wakefulness. You can see that um, they're all active there, but we can make a distinction during sleep, uh, if we contrast non-REM and REM sleep, so I highlighted in red here um, some things to be aware of. First of all, orexin we'll talk about, very important in understanding of the pathophysiology of narcolepsy. We can see here it's very active during wakefulness and there's no activity during either REM or non-REM sleep. And so we'll discuss here the importance of orexin um, and the, uh, in, in more detail here in the lecture. Uh, notice that there are two areas of production of acetylcholine that are important for sleep. One is in the basal forebrain, remember the nucleus of Maynard that produces acetylcholine, important for memory function. Um, so that's somewhat released during non-REM sleep, not released during uh, REM sleep. But more importantly here, uh, there are um, areas in the pons that produce um, acetylcholine. And this seems to be th clearly the most active area of the brain for REM sleep. Okay, so we see a spike in that acetylcholine from the pons uh, during the REM stages of sleep. And dopamine we can see is not produced during uh, non-REM sleep and is produced during REM sleep. And maybe we can kind of imagine, you know, think about you have your colorful dreams during REM sleep. And remember the hallucinations when you give dopamine medications uh, to patients with Parkinson's disease. So maybe you can remember it that way. So REM sleep, we have a few areas, but especially here, acetylcholine in the pons uh, that is involved. All right, so here's a drawing, a fourth year student uh, just finished a couple of weeks ago for me to try to illustrate some of the anatomy um, here of sleep. So one um, important area is in the hypothalamus. The nucleus is called the ventral lateral preoptic area. Okay, and so that is right here, okay, in purple. That's the ventral lateral preoptic area. Um, in contrast here, we have these arousal centers. And so uh, these are described in the text of your handout, but up here we have uh, near the mammillary bodies, uh, the production of uh, histamine in the um, hypothalamus. Uh, back here around the cerebral aqueduct, we have production of dopamine. And then down here in the pons, we have uh, raphe nucleus, Lucas ceruleus, uh, serotonin, norepinephrine production. And so all of these are arousal centers that are active during wakefulness. Okay, and so during sleep, there is an important connection here between the ventral lateral preoptic area and all of these arousal centers. This is the area is drawn here in purple. And basically during sleep, this area, the hypothalamus, just keeps those areas quiet. Okay, so it, it inhibits the uh, arousal centers. Okay, so we know that's what's going on during sleep. Okay, now to get to sleep, uh, it's a little more complicated. There's an adjacent area here called the medial preoptic nucleus. Here we see the lateral or ventral lateral preoptic nucleus. They're adjacent to each other. And uh, when you're getting drowsy and it's about time for sleep, there are a lot of things that happen that uh, appear to activate the medial preoptic 
uh, nucleus. And the medial preoptic nucleus is what triggers uh, here the ventral lateral preoptic nucleus to shut down those activating arousal centers. All right, so um, think of the medial preoptic nucleus as important for sleep initiation, and the lateral preoptic nucleus is what's active throughout the night to um, keep you asleep. Okay, and uh, this happens, you know, uh, immediately. So that when you fall asleep, there isn't a long, slow transition. It's just one minute you're awake, next minute you're asleep. Um, and so, again, the difference between these two areas for sleep induction, where it's keeping you asleep throughout the night, and again, during wakefulness, what happens is these activating centers, arousal centers in the brainstem, now become relatively overactive and inhibit the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus, and we wake up. Okay, and so this is uh, sometimes referred to as a sleep-wake switch, or it's just on or off, which is a good thing. Otherwise, we'd have these, you know, hours of transition from wakefulness into sleep and hours, you know, to wake up. So it happens um, immediately. Okay, another important area here in the hypothalamus um, are these uh, orexin neurons, sometimes called hypocrete. Okay, and so... Um, these are very active during the day, when w especially when you're moving, walking, moving your hands, and they are alerting. They alert all of these um, activating arousal centers in the brainstem. Okay, this is why, you know, if you've ever had the experience on a long drive and you're having a hard time staying awake, you, you know, tap your hand on the steering wheel or shake your leg or something, and that alerts you a little bit. So what's happening there is the orexon neurons become activated by movement, and so they th then activate these arousal um, centers. So remember that because when we come back to narcolepsy, we'll talk a little bit, explain why there's a dropout in orexin neurons in patients that have narcolepsy. Okay, another important part of the uh, sleep physiology is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and this is involved in setting circadian rhythms. Okay, so we can see light coming in here from the retina to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, okay? And there's a lot uh, here in terms of the anatomy that I don't uh, really want you to know in detail, but I think the one thing that's important is just, you know, think about that pathway for Horner syndrome. Remember that goes from the hypothalamus down to C8T1, back up to the pupil. Well, this is the same pathway um, here that is involved. Notice that from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, we end up actually um, activating um, here this uh, sympathetic uh, pathway and the result is that you actually end up uh, shutting down the pineal gland uh, which releases melatonin. Okay, so that's why during light uh, this actually uh, here inhibits uh, here the pineal gland and so it, it uh, inhibits production of melatonin uh, during light and in uh, dark, this pathway kind of shuts down then and melatonin um, is released. So this is important for uh, also for sleep-wake cycles, feeding, temperature, and uh, again, remember uh, melatonin uh, related to that. Okay, so when you think about sleep disorders, uh, the test that's really helpful for uh, many patients with this is called polysomnography, which consists of three main components. Uh, first, we do an EEG during this test. And uh, worthwhile to know just a little bit about brain frequencies. Um, so when you're awake, um, and not to get too technical, but when your eyes are closed, this is when we tend to see these, this rhythm from usually the occipital lobe. It's called an alpha frequency. And so we can tell when someone has an EEG and their eyes are closed, and we see a frequency of 8 to 13 hertz, uh, the patient's awake. When you fall asleep, you move into these slower stages. Four to seven hertz is theta, and less than four hertz is delta. That's really deep sleep, the deeper stages of sleep. Beta activity is mainly an artifact um, that we see. Uh, actually, some medications can cause that really fast rhythm. So most important is remember the alpha frequency. Anything slower than that, the patient's falling into deep sleep. The other part of the polysomnography testing is the um, 
uh, oculogram. It turns out that the cornea is a little bit positive, uh, the retina is a little bit negative, and so we put these electrodes on either side of the eye. And so when the eye moves during sleep, okay, especially REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, then we get an electrical representation of those eye movements. Okay, so the electrooculogram here is important part of um, the polysomnography testing. Okay, and then we put an EMG electrode. Now we don't have to put a needle into the muscle, but we can put a surface electrode, and that's usually done over the submentalis muscle. Okay, so we have a patient sleep in the sleep lab, and we measure these things. Okay, so here are the normal sleep stages. Um, so when you initially fall asleep, you go into stage one. And so this moves from, remember, the alpha frequency into the theta frequency. Stage two sleep, okay, we spend about half of the night in stage two overall. Okay, and we get some distinctive EEG waveforms during stage two, uh, K-complexes and sleep spindles. And what is just fascinating in the last few years there's some good evidence that sleep spindles uh, represent, that it's the electrical representation of consolidating memory, right? And so when you're uh, especially moving short-term into long-term memory, um, you know, we can see that on an EEG. Uh, so I, I put a note there in your hand, actually pretty good evidence that staying up all night studying is usually counterproductive because the, a good sleep before a test <coughs> gives you a better opportunity to uh, consolidate memory. Okay, so move into stage three uh, sleep. Now we're starting to see some delta activity, and the deepest stage of sleep is mainly uh, delta slow wave activity. Okay, so these are the non-REM stages of sleep, stage one through four. And during non-REM, as the name indicates, non-rapid eye movement, okay, we're not gonna see eye movements. Now, it's true that when someone just falls asleep during stage one, so we get what are called slow rolling eye movements. They just tend to roll back and forth a little bit, but as soon as someone goes into stage two, that's the end of the eye movements. Um, EMG activity or the submentalis muscle during non-REM sleep um, is reduced, but it's not absent. That's the key thing. There still is some muscle movement uh, during non-REM sleep. Okay, and so the most important contrast here with REM sleep, obviously we get lots of eye movements, so that's a it's an obvious feature, but EMG activity is absent, okay? Because during REM sleep, just your eyes move and you can breathe, but otherwise you should have essential paralysis of muscles elsewhere in the body, okay? And again, that will be important later when we talk about narcolepsy and, uh, and REM sleep behavior disorder. Okay, so um, again, I wouldn't expect you to be able to understand anything here about the waveforms, but here let's just say this is an alpha frequency, okay? And um, uh, during REM sleep, we get some distinctive waveforms, and during non-REM sleep, okay? But um, notice here during EMG, this is the main reason I wanted to show this, that there's muscle activity, of course, when we're awake and during non-REM sleep, but notice virtually nothing during REM sleep. So we need that muscle activity uh, absent here to support, you know, diagnosis of REM sleep. And when we do our um, uh, oculogram here testing, uh, relatively little eye movements during non-REM sleep, but look at all of the eye movements during REM sleep. Okay, so kind of the contrast here between eye movements and muscle activity uh, during REM sleep. Probably the most important thing here on this slide. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, variation here in sleep stages. Most people go through somewhere between four and six. Um, and uh, I'm sorry to insult you by putting it out to eight hours here, but anyway. Um, so when you fall asleep, you, you fall pretty quickly into the deep stages of sleep. Some people, this can take up to an hour. Some people fall down to stage four within 20, 30 minutes. So again, there's some variation, and some of that can depend on how tired you are in that particular evening. But so you fall down into stage two, three, four sleep, and so usually the first sleep cycle is the longest deep stage, stage four, okay? And so then you go up into a lighter sleep, and so then there we have our first REM sleep here. 
And then another cycle down to stage four, but it's shorter. Okay, and again, there could be a little variation here. It can slip back and forth between two, three, and four. And notice now we go to a longer REM sleep. And throughout the night, notice that the deeper stages of sleep are shorter. Whereas in general, notice that the REM stages of sleep are longer uh, towards the end of the night. Okay, so you actually dream in all stages of sleep, but they're most vivid during REM sleep. And since REM tends to occur, um, you know, when we're waking up, that's why often dreams during that period of time are uh, memorable. Okay, notice also we've got these little bursts here during the night. Um, we have little micro wakes throughout the night. Um, usually we're not aware of these. Okay, we do wake up briefly. And if you fall right back to sleep, you're not going to remember that. Okay. As people get older, however, those little micro wakes, now you're aware, have to go to the bathroom and things like that. And so this can actually be uh, kind of problematic for uh, the elderly. Okay, so uh, again, we go through these four to six sleep stages. And so as I mentioned, stage three and four dominate the first third of the night. Overall makes up about 15 to 25% of sleep. REM increases throughout the night, makes up about 20 to 25% of sleep. And again, stage two, where we get the sleep spindles, uh, makes up about half of the night overall. <coughs> okay, so there are a lot of changes that happen with sleep um, with aging. Okay, and so I just pointed out the highlights here. Um, you know, teenagers, what are they known for? Staying up late and sleeping in a long time. And that is not, there, there's actually, there is a physiologic change to the biological clock during those years. And that's why it's very difficult for teenagers frequently to stick with their high school schedule. They naturally just want to stay up late and sleep later. And so um, this is often a problem with sleep deprivation um, in teenagers. And usually they do a lot of catch up sleep uh, during the weekend. And sometimes, you know, even people your age that can lag into the 20s or so. We're just, you know, an 8 a.m. lecture is really difficult if this is, you know, kind of what you're set on. Okay, now in the elderly here, important to remember this, that there's a loss of even both stage three and four sleep is common in the elderly. So they lose the deeper stages of sleep and therefore often the quality of sleep is not as good. They wake up a lot during the night and you know can feel tired and fatigued during the day. And so this is often problematic. And again, if there are other medical things, you know, prostate or pain or other things, they're just much more likely to, to wake up. Okay, if you've ever watched a newborn uh, sleep, the eyes, I mean, it just looks like a seizure almost. It's quite dramatic. So about half of sleep in newborns is REM sleep. And again, that diminishes uh, to 25% for most of life, and, and REM sleep will also decrease in the elderly. So again, sleep efficiency declines with age. And so that's just a, a normal thing. So here are some general guidelines for a uh, number of hours of sleep. Okay, so you can see that, you know, up to eight months, it's enormous sleep requirements. Okay, children in general sh should sleep nine to 10 hours. Teenagers, somewhere in this range, you know, but again, I found that with all three of my kids, just it's not going to happen during high school. And so oftentimes they need to get catch up sleep on the weekends. Um, adults, there's a range for this, but in general, seven to eight and a half hours is kind of a good uh, target for adults. And older adults sometimes just can't sleep more than five to six hours. Yes. That's a good question. Is it possible to catch up on sleep? Well, um, I think there's some... Yeah, I think if you've just had a week where you've not slept during the week, yes, I think there is a restorative um, aspect to sleeping longer on the weekends, but it's not ideal, certainly. But I just, you know, just practically, what do you do sometimes, right? Okay, so we'll go through some sleep disorders. Insomnia, which can either be a difficulty getting to sleep or maintaining uh, sleep, you know, keep waking up during the night. By definition, there needs to be some physical component during the day, some just fatigue and sleepiness and physical symptoms during the day. So it needs to have some daytime uh, impairment. 
So here are some of the different categories of insomnia. Uh, first is a paradoxical insomnia, sometimes called sleep misperception syndrome. And these are individuals that say they just can't sleep. They're horrible sleep at nighttime. And you bring them in for a sleep study and you watch them sleep for eight and a half hours without waking up once. And you ask the patient and they say, that was horrible. I was tossing and turning, waking up all night. And so it's a misperception of sleep, but there's no documentation of an actual um, sleeping disorder. Okay, psychophysiological insomnia refers to individuals who have just an intense fixation on an inability to get to sleep. And that's very, can be um, quite activating. And so uh, just a, a fixation with inability to get to sleep and um, overlaps quite a bit actually with insomnia due to anxiety. Probably most of us here have experienced that during a stressful time. You're trying to go to sleep and your mind is just going. So anxiety tends to result in difficulty getting to sleep. In contrast to depression, where oftentimes early morning awakening can be a feature associated with depression. Okay, so and just in contrast, I think I put this in your handout, schizophrenia patients uh, sleep normally. So you see some different types of sleep patterns with anxiety, depression, and, and other disorders. When someone has insomnia, we always want to do a very careful medication inventory, drug, alcohol, caffeine, uh, because this is a big problem here, insomnia due to drug or substance use. Okay, and I'm just amazed at how poor um, sleep hygiene is for a lot of the individuals that I see that complain of uh, insomnia. So I just put here some of the issues involved. Having a very irregular, if you have insomnia, it's definitely not good to have an irregular schedule. All right, so if you're going to bed at eight one night, and one in the morning, um, that's just not good, you know, for the circadian rhythms and all of that. So you want to try to have a regular sleep time. Um, you know, what does light do? It inhibits the release of melatonin. And so if you have difficulty sleeping, the, the, the worst thing is to be, you know, looking at your iPhone until the minute before you close your eyes and try to get to sleep. So to decrease screen time, exercise also if it's done within a few hours of getting to sleep for some individuals is very activating, can make it difficult for them to get to sleep. Um, and caffeine, alcohol, and smoking are all um, issues for insomnia. So if someone has insomnia, you know, certainly shouldn't have caffeine after noon or maybe not at all. Uh, again, alcohol can be an issue. Sometimes people you know, we'll have a few beers and that helps them get to sleep, but oftentimes then they'll wake up um, after a few hours. Okay, when someone has insomnia, um, we like to have uh, them take a sleep diary. So they just write down what they do every day. When do they take naps and all of that? Uh, but in general, naps are counterproductive. You have a nap during the afternoon, then, you know, often because of a poor sleep at night, but then it makes it, you just kind of get into this cycle. You can't get to sleep than that evening because of uh, the nap. Okay, so here are official recommendations from the Sleep Foundation. Um, and so I'll go over these with patients. So at night here, the first one, you know, you wanna, if someone has insomnia, you don't wanna associate that with the, the bedroom with negative things, right? So if you're stressed about exams or whatever and you have a hard time sleeping, um, you know, don't spend the last five minutes reading your textbook in bed. You know, be, do that somewhere else, and we just save the bedroom for other um, activities. <laughs> uh, this, this is their official recommendation, so I'm just <laughs> passing this along. So we want to establish a regular bedtime routine. That's very important. Don't eat or drink too close to bedtime. Um, have a nice sleep-promoting environment, so it should be dark. Uh, really, the room should be cool. Okay, if it's too hot, that interferes with sleep. Um, oftentimes having some background noise, a fan or something like that um, can help as well. During the day, and all, all these are kind of obvious, but it's amazing how many individuals, this is quite enlightening. They'd never thought of that before. Caffeine, you know, if you drink a pot of coffee per day, that's going to pro be problematic for sleep. Alcohol smoking, close to bedtime, should be avoided. Exercise is great, but uh, if you've got insomnia, it shouldn't be done within three hours of going to bed. And we really want to, and this can be hard to break, but 
um, stop taking naps for a period of time. And often, oftentimes things will get worse for a while, but we'll just try to save the sleep for nighttime. Okay, and then I give patients, I have a, sh a sheet where I ask them to keep a sleep diary, write down when they went to bed and when they take naps and all of that, and then you can go over that with them at the follow-up visit. Okay, so here are some medications, and first we'll go over the FDA-approved medications um, for sleep. Okay, so uh, two of the most common used here are on the GABA-A receptor, and um, so one is classified as a benzodiazepine receptor agonist, the other as a non-benzodiazepine receptor agonist, and really this distinction is meaningless. And so um, don't worry about, they're actually categorized differently, but their actual action doesn't seem to be really any different at all. And so these are common ones uh, that are used, temazepam, zolpidem, some of you may know Ambien, um, florazepam. Okay, so um, all of these can help, but the problem is the longer you're on these medications, and if you just get accustomed to taking this every single night, then um, a rebound insomnia can happen when you stop taking the medication. It becomes impossible to sleep at all. And so really these should just be used, ideally, for short-term use. So if someone's going through a really stressful time, and okay, that may be an indication for a short-term course of these medications, but we really don't want to have this be the, the ongoing treatment, the way we're going to manage the insomnia. Okay, so the GABA receptor here, all of these act on the alpha subunit here of the GABA receptor. Here's Zolpidem, other benzodiazepines. All right, so remember, um, we also talked about benzodiazepines in status epilepticus, right? The heavy-duty ones like lorazepam and diazepam for knocking out seizure activity. Th those will also put you to sleep, but those are usually not the ones used for uh, insomnia. Now, interestingly, melatonin is not FDA approved for insomnia, whereas the melatonin receptor agonist, that's called Remelteon, um, is FDA approved for insomnia. So um, honestly, don't use this a lot, but apparently it helps some individuals. There's also a histamine antagonist. Remember, histamine is activating. And so doxepin is a histamine uh, antagonist that, um, that can be helpful and less likely uh, to give a patient that uh, rebound insomnia like you'd get with a uh, benzodiazepine uh, medication. Okay, now all the time, uh, physicians prescribe medications that have sedating properties for sleep, but m most of those are not actually FDA approved. So tricyclic antidepressants, for example, are tend to be sedating medications, um, but they're not really formally indicated. I would encourage you sometime just go to a pharmacy and just look through the medications. It's fascinating what is out there for common things like insomnia. But if you look at the over-counter medications for insomnia, they generally have one thing in common. They have diphenhydramine, an antihistamine um, in it for sleep. And that does help, but the problem is that often lingers on, especially in older individuals, into the morning. And I've had so many patients take these and they just feel thick-headed and foggy, you know, for the first few hours of the morning um, using these medications. Okay, so again, look through them and oh, there it is, diphenhydramine. That's usually in common. Okay, and just, I would say, probably hundreds of things where there's not a shred of evidence, but they're used. And, and again, placebo effect can be very powerful. So if you take something you believe is going to help you get to sleep, then it may help. And I guess if there's a positive placebo effect, then uh, what's wrong with that? But a lot of things that you see over the counter are uh, placebo. Okay, so we have some sleep-related movement disorders. Restless leg syndrome, and I have a little video of a patient encounter uh, that I had with a patient with this to describe it for you. You can watch on Canvas. But um, oftentimes, this is kind of what I find believable when I'm taking the history, patients say it's just really hard to describe. And okay, that I've heard so many times that I'm already primed for restless leg syndrome. It's a, it's a feeling in the legs that's hard to describe. Sometimes creepy, crawly, pressure, uncomfortable, an urge to move the legs. It's usually in the calf um, area or below the knees. 
And so um, there is a hereditary uh, aspect to restless leg syndrome. And so it, it it's n doesn't bother patients in general during the day when they're up walking, okay? But especially lying flat, even if they lie flat during the day, the symptoms come out, okay? And so it's a, just an incredible urge to move and stretch the legs. And if they get up and walk around, the symptoms of the leg go away, then they go back to bed, and then the symptoms come out again. Keeps them from getting to sleep. So restless leg syndrome is associated with iron deficiency. And they're actually low iron levels in the uh, basal ganglia in patients with restless leg syndrome. Okay, so first thing we do when we see someone with restless legs is check uh, a ferritin level and treat that if it's low. Okay, but medications for restless legs include the dopamine agonists that we talked about for Parkinson's, pramipexol, rapinerol. And just like we discussed, you know, these can cause impulse control disorder, gambling and so on. Uh, it can do the same thing when you give these medications for restless leg syndrome. So you need to be aware of that. Um, and gabapentin, and now there's a long-acting form of gabapentin, um, is also an effective treatment for restless leg syndrome. Okay, now more than 80% of patients with restless leg syndrome will have periodic leg movements of sleep as well. But this can also be a separate um, condition on its own. It doesn't always have to go along with restless leg syndrome. The other name for this is nocturnal myoclonus, and these are quite dramatic leg jerks during sleep. Okay, and it's often helpful if you have the spouse um, at the visit, okay, because um, this bothers the patient, restless leg syndrome. They just can't get to sleep. Um, this mainly bothers the spouse. Okay, because the patient is asleep, but they keep having these leg jerks, and so they wake the spouse up with this. So a little bit of a difference there. This can be very, very difficult to treat, um, but it's generally treated like we treat uh, restless leg syndrome. Okay, now this one here is uh, certainly probably the highest yield board question, I would say, out of this handout. Um, narcolepsy, which is a hypersomnia of central origin. Narcolepsy is a fascinating condition. I think the best way in a nutshell to understand narcolepsy is that there is REM intrusion into wakefulness. It doesn't belong there, right? A REM intrusion into wakefulness. And so uh, more than 90% 90 90 of patients have this um, allele and narcolepsy is interesting. It has a bimodal distribution, tends to peak at age 15 or 35. Okay, and so there's a dropout of these orexin neurons. And so there's evidence, this is maybe not a very helpful slide, but there's some antigen that seems to trigger this. And so we know two specific examples, um, if you have streptococcal antibodies, or when there was an H1N1 uh, outbreak some years ago, there was a corresponding, quotes, outbreak of narcolepsy during that. So something happens here with an, an antigen uh, binding with a, an HLA molecule that ends up knocking out the orexin neurons in the hypothalamus. Okay, and again, what do those orexin neurons do when you're active, when you're moving? They keep the arousal centers and the brainstem, um, you know, keeping you awake and alert. Okay, and so the four cardinal features of narcolepsy then, uh, first is just excessive daytime somnolence. Okay, so the, the normal movements, even just sitting here, you're moving around, you're writing, uh, that's keeping you awake, even if you're sleep deprived, hopefully. Um, but for these individuals, even the slightest sedentary condition, um, and they just drop off to sleep. Okay, there was a medical student here years ago who had narcolepsy, and you know he'd fall asleep almost every single day, you know, and I think people understood what was going on. But these are individuals, when I come out to the waiting room and get them, they're asleep you know, in the waiting room. And so I unless they are really, you know, out and about walking, um, they just fall asleep very easily, okay? And they slip right into REM sleep, which is kind of a, an unusual feature. Remember, typically it takes us a while to get into REM sleep. Okay, here is usually though, because so a lot of individuals feel drowsy during the day. So um, sleep deprivation, or insomnia, a lot of things can cause people to fall asleep many times throughout the day. But 
if we have these other features, now this is when it becomes really compelling that we're dealing with narcolepsy. All right, so cataplexy um, refers to a sudden loss of muscle tone um, that is usually triggered by something. Okay, that can be pain, uh, that can be laughing at a joke, being surprised. Um, and so what happens here is there's actually REM intrusion. And remember, during REM sleep, you have muscle paralysis. Right? And so what happens during uh, cataplexy is patients suddenly lose all muscle tone. And so they just drop to the floor. Okay? And so um, I've seen a lot of patients with this. A lady that I treated for years for narcolepsy loved to bowl. <coughs> and people would tell a joke and she would just fall to the ground. Um, I had a patient with narcolepsy years ago and he wanted to tell me a joke. And then he started laughing and then he just <laughs> collapsed to the floor. So um, a lot of things can trigger this. Um, interestingly, it was um, the, they made the association with the orexon neurons uh, about 20 years ago or so with uh, uh, dogs that have narcolepsy. Okay, um, and I'll just tell you, you can waste hours <laughs> on YouTube looking at dogs with cataplexy. <laughs> so, um, but uh, anyway, uh, that's a classic feature, and, and actually, we may as well show it here. I'm going to hopefully not blast you away here with volume. He gives new he meaning gives to the phrase to dog, the dog tired, tired, the narcoleptic poodle, poodle who falls asleep, falls asleep at the drop of a hat. Pub Wood reports Pub the pouch out pooch is something of a medical of a mystery. Medical mystery. <laughs> Skeeter, Skeeter is a small, is a small dog, dog with a very with a big, big problem. problem. No matter no how matter much he how struggles, much he struggles, to, struggles stay to stay awake, he can. He can. For this 11-pound toy poodle, almost every almost moment, every is, moment a is a disturbing losing battle, battle, battle with the urge with to the sleep. Urge sleep. There, he there he goes, out cold. Out cold. Skeeter, Skeeter, has Skeeter has narcolepsy, an uncontrollable urge to sleep. Skeeter's struggles to stay awake are heartbreaking for his family, the Hendersons of Chubbuck, Idaho. His Narcolepsy is triggered by excitement, so he can be out for an afternoon walk and just fall asleep sitting up. The tail wagging prospect of jumping up on Shari Henderson's lap suddenly sets Skeeter snoozing. Come on, come on. Oh, he's miserable. He looked like he was a prisoner. So, you know, I just imagine triggered by excitement. I mean, what are dogs known for? I mean, it's like, <laughs> so. Anyway, so animals can have narcolepsy as well. Um, so two other features of narcolepsy are sleep paralysis. And this can either happen uh, on the transition falling to sleep or on uh, wakefulness. And so, again, it's REM intrusion. So you're awake but there's some REM activity that keeps the muscles paralyzed. And so I would say, I'll bet, it, I'll bet someone in the room has had this because both of these can occasionally happen in normal individuals. This doesn't mean that you have narcolepsy. Um, a neurologist I worked with had this once, and it was terrifying. He was awake, completely aware of what was going on, but he couldn't move a muscle in his body. And he wondered, you know, am I locked in or what's going on here? But it was just a, a sleep paralysis episode. Likewise, hallucinations. Again, think of the tense dreams during REM sleep. And so we can just have that component of, of it, but now during wakefulness. And this can either happen when falling asleep, uh, that's called uh, hypnagogic uh, hallucinations, or on waking, hypnopompic hallucinations. And so during that transition, there will be like a vision you know, or something spectacular on the ceiling or whatever, and that just reflects uh, REM intrusion. Okay. People with narcolepsy also don't have very good restorative sleep, so they have abnormal sleep at nighttime as well. And so if we're getting that story, and again, especially you've got the cataplexy, not just someone who's tired during the day, uh, we want to confirm this uh, because, you know, these are some pretty heavy-duty medications used to treat narcolepsy. And so we do what's called a multiple sleep latency test. Now, this is part of the polysomnogra polysomnography <coughs> testing where we basic basically have the patient in a sleep lab, we lie them down in a nice, comfortable uh, bed in a dark room, and that's irresistible for someone with narcolepsy. They're going to fall asleep. Then you keep waking them up. And so uh, basically, in narcolepsy, they fall asleep 
within 10 minutes, just predictably. Okay. Again, many of us here, if you're tired, you could fall asleep within 10 minutes. But if we kept waking you up again and again and again, you would at some point not be able just to fall right back asleep again. And when we look at the polysomnography testing, we can see that patients go right into REM sleep, which again is, that's usually an hour and a half or more into the night that you have your first REM sleep episode. So if we have these two features, then the patient has narcolepsy. Okay. So um, years ago, you know, to keep patients awake, we were using amphetamine type medication. So it's, uh, and I've had individuals say that they have narcolepsy just because they wanted amphetamine type medications. But now more and more we're using a medication called modafinil, um, which is much safer. And it increases activating neurotransmitters like norepinephrine, dopamine, and also histamine. And so this can be quite helpful, um, alerting for patients during the day with narcolepsy. Um, cataplexy can be treated with either tricyclic antidepressants, okay, that we learned about for preventing migraines, like nortriptyline, amitriptyline, and the SSRIs um, can also be helpful for cataplexy. Those, this is a treatable condition. All right, then we have sleep disordered breathing, and you will learn about this later here in the second year, so um, I'll just cover some big picture uh, areas of this. Much more common is obstructive sleep apnea. So uh, again, super common, about a quarter of men have this, 10% of middle-aged women, and so this is correlated with obesity. Okay, a small chin, big tonsils, and adenoids, uvula, more posterior pharyngeal tissue, and so uh, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you the grading um, here of this, but you can see an obvious different difference here between position one, looks pretty good, compared to position four. So you want to have the patient open their mouth and just look and see what does the airway, airway look like. And you can imagine this patient, you know, during sleep is going to have obstruction. All right, so uh, important to have the spouse there. So usually the story is a lot of loud snoring, and apnea episodes at night. So periods of time where the patient will stop breathing, and then oftentimes there'll be some snorts and movements, and then breathing again, falling asleep, and then into another apnea episode. And uh, it's amazing when we do sleep studies, uh, we'll find these patients will wake up hundreds of times during the night because they have apnea, then hypoxia, that's alerting. Okay, and so it's just such a poor quality of sleep uh, these individuals have. So because of that, they have intense daytime hypersomnolence. So they're sleeping frequently throughout the day. Okay, again, it's not narcolepsy because they don't have cataplexy, sleep paralysis, and the hallucinations. Okay, and here I highlighted this because uh, this is oftentimes, um, you know, I see patients referred for headaches. And if someone tells me they have a horrible headache when they wake up in the morning, and then it gets better throughout the day, if you hear that, you want to think about sleep apnea because you could be trying a whole bunch of things to treat the headaches, but really what needs to happen is you need to fix the sleep apnea. So intense morning headaches, um, consider doing a sleep study to see if the patient has sleep apnea. Okay, And again, you will learn about a whole bunch of medical, cardiac, pretty significant complications of having sleep apnea. <coughs> All right, so during a sleep study, what we see here is here's airflow and there's an apnea epi episode. And the patient breathes again and they have another period of uh, apnea. So we measure during a sleep study, uh, we have these uh, bands we can put around the abdomen and the chest. And so what we're seeing here is during the apnea, so hypoxia develops and the body is trying to you know, take a breath. And so we get effort here in the abdomen and the thorax to breathe, but it's not able to overcome the obstruction until here. Okay, and then we, the patient takes some breaths again. Um, this is a little confusing here. Um, look at the O2 saturation go down, and you're wondering, well, the patient just breathes. Why is the saturation still going down? And this just reflects the delayed um, pulmonary circulation time. Okay, so th this breath here is correlated with the rise in oxygen here. But again, they're still having these uh, periodic episodes of um, hypoxia um, at nighttime. So very poor quality of sleep. 
And so there are a whole bunch of things that can be done for sleep apnea. Uh, of course, we encourage weight loss. Um, and we can give a patient uh, CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure. We have to wear a mask to try to keep the throat open at nighttime. Uh, many individuals just hate wearing this and feel that it's uncomfortable. Um, and so oftentimes we have to work very carefully with our sleep lab to get a comfortable uh, mask. And some individuals will respond to surgery. You know, you remove the tonsils and any tissue, if possible, to uh, open up the airway. All right, much less common is um, central sleep apnea. But you should be able to recognize kind of in a big picture on a, on a sleep study how this is different. Notice in a central sleep apnea, we still have apnea episodes, right? But notice here there's no effort here in the thorax or abdomen to take a breath. There's no drive from the brain to do that, okay? So if you see this, then you're actually dealing with the central sleep apnea. And this can occur with um, lesions in the brain stem or sometimes up upper cervical cord that disrupt descending pathways that are going down to supply the diaphragm. Uh, really, I think the only neurologic condition we've talked about in this course that can cause this is myotonic dystrophy, way back one of our first lectures. So this is associated with a central sleep apnea. Okay, I won't go into the treatment of that. All right, parasomnias. Um, really important that with each of these, you know what sleep stage they occur in. Okay, that would probably be the common board question here. Somnambulism or sleepwalking. Um, you can see about 70% of kids have this. It goes down, um, you know, into adulthood, less common. So this is autosomal dominant. Okay, I have this. Two of my kids had this. And so, um, you know, uh, as a kid, I would walk around the house and turn the TV on and do different things and completely unaware, and my patients, parents would just kind of uh, guide me back into bed, and two of our kids did the same thing. So our son would come in at night and just sit there in a chair with kind of a glassy, you know, look. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> and so um, this happens during stage three, four sleep, and so individuals, kids that have this will have no memory of the um, episodes. Okay, really not anything you can do about this except try to, you know, prevent harm. If you can close a door or lock a door or something like that, if it goes down to a stair or something like that. Now, REM sleep behavior disorder we've talked about in relationship here, very important with the synucleinopathies. And remember, there are three of those, diffuse Lewy body, Parkinson's, and multisystem atrophy. And so all three of these conditions have REM sleep behavior disorder. And so these individuals lose the muscle paralysis during REM sleep, which is normal. They act out their dreams, often very violently. Okay, so they hit and thrash around at nighttime, uh, much more common in men. Okay, and so um, this is treatable. Clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine medication, actually works very well. But really, now we're starting with melatonin. Uh, this has been proven in studies to actually be quite helpful, melatonin. Uh, really no side effects with melatonin. So we'll try that initially, um, and it can, can really help. So the concern when we diagnose REM sleep behavior disorder is that, uh, notice on this chart, here's neurologic disease-free. So if we look at patients, uh, here these were 174 patients with REM sleep behavior disorder, notice that over time, more and more of them get a synucleinopathy. Okay, and so if we get out here to 14, 15 years, there are only 10% or so that didn't develop a synucleinopathy. So when we diagnose REM sleep behavior disorder, um, you know, we're primed so to look for features of Parkinson's, hallucinations, uh, orthostasis with multisystem atrophy. So that's a concerning diagnosis uh, when we make it. So these patients need to follow regularly with the neurologist. Night terrors also occur during stage three, four sleep, like somnambulism. And so these are generally seen in children um, who just wake up screaming, okay? And it's very intense. And so they're not consolable, and it lasts for a period of time, and then they just fall right back asleep, okay? And then the parents can't get to sleep after that, right? But it's again, it's because it's in the deeper stages of sleep, they won't have any memory of that in the morning. If we contrast that with a nightmare, 
Okay, those are during REM sleep. And so that you can talk about, you know, at the breakfast table in the morning, you remember the dream very much. Okay, there's no memory of a night terror. So a nightmare is much less intense and there's memory for the dream. Okay, bedwetting or nocturnal enuresis is also a feature of uh, deep sleep stage four. And this uh, frequently is just a developmental lag of the central nervous system. And as kids get older, they grow out of it. Um, but it can also be seen if, you know, parents are going through a divorce or there's just a very stressful time. We can see it as a psychological uh, manifestation as well. Okay, last thing quickly are the circadian rhythm sleep disorders where we have a mismatch or misalignment between the circadian rhythm 24-hour cycle and the external environment. And two of these, um, remember I said that in the elderly uh, individuals, well, contrast with teenagers, let's maybe start with this, that teenagers w just naturally want to stay up later and sleep later. And to an extreme degree, uh, this can be pathologic and we call it a delay sleep phase disorder. Some individuals just cannot sleep until one, two in the morning. Okay, and then we would call it a delays, delayed sleep phase disorder. As people get older, this one is more common. Okay, so in the elderly, they just can't stay awake past seven at night. Okay, and so they have an advanced sleep phase disorder where they're going to bed early and then they're waking up at two in the morning. <coughs> okay, and then finally, the one that we're probably familiar with here is jet lag disorder, um, which tends to be worse when traveling east, be probably because it's more difficult <coughs> for the circadian rhythms to adjust to advancing uh, time zones. And so the further you travel, the more likely you are to have this. And so you know, you experience intense lethargy, very irritable, sleepy during the day uh, when you arrive. And so really the best thing for jet lag to, is to try to resynchronize and so really to be exposed to as much light as possible. So if you fly to U Europe and you arrive in the afternoon, don't take a nap. Be out in the sun as much as possible and that helps to reset here the circadian rhythms. Uh, taking melatonin uh, can also be helpful um, to kind of help to reestablish uh, sleep cycle. Okay, sorry for going a bit over. We'll see you tomorrow.